Okay, this will be the first lecture. I'll be using this for two different classes. So um, I'll share the link, you don't know which it is. It's either Visual Narration Asia or A History of Asian Art. And um, this is what I'll do with each section. I'll have a section on China, another on Japan, and the last on South Asia, so modern day India and Pakistan. And um, we'll have an introduction in each section. And this introduction will probably seem a little bit overwhelming at first. Uh, and that's not exactly by design, but don't worry about it. Um, some of the, all of these concepts will come back later on and we'll see them in art. And we'll see these examples of these ideas over and over again. So if you don't get it the first time, uh, don't worry about it so much. Uh, you'll probably get it as we go along. So the first slide that I'm showing you is something that's pretty interesting. And when I do these classes in real life, uh, I ask the, in real life, in-person classes, I ask the students how much they think this painting costs. Um, and I tell them that this is what's called a two-stroke painting. So it's made with a very large, uh, like the size of a broom, uh, paintbrush, and there were just two strokes made. Uh, so it literally took as long as you could imagine that to take, uh, just a few seconds. Uh, so if you want to, you can kind of guess yourself and pause the video. And then I'll tell you how much it costs. So are you ready? Uh, think about what you guess. Um, this one went for $99,000. Um, so that seems like a lot. And I'm not saying that I'll be able to justify the price of this, which is a contemporary work, by the way. Um, it was made in 1999. I'm not saying I'm gonna be able to justify this. Um, however, I think you may understand as we go through the course, um, why this is considered to be a legitimate form of art. Uh, and we'll see some of the same dynamics when we get into Japan as well. So one way that's helpful to think about China is instead of thinking of it as a country that is an ethnicity, like you would see in European countries, um, like if you go to Poland, there'll be a whole lot of Polish people there. Um, and in some places of the world, this is also the case. Instead, uh, think of it as an empire, um, and it's always been an empire. Uh, we'll study a little bit later on uh, that in the third century BC, that China was united, and I could put up the air quotes for united. Uh, and from that point on, it remained an empire, sometimes expanding, uh, sometimes contracting. So a good way to think about China is to imagine, if you're familiar with Western history, think of the Roman Empire and imagine that it had never fallen. Uh, that is China. Uh, so China is known uh, internally, and this is before... Uh, the People's Republic of China, as Zhangguo, which means the middle kingdom or country. Uh, so since ancient times, uh, the Chinese have seen themselves as the center of the universe. Uh, they had a cosmology where they imagined the, the earth to be this kind of canopy with four corners uh, and the middle kingdom being in the center. As far as the name China um, that's used uh, outside of China. It's not really known what the etymology is, possibly from the Qin Dynasty, which is that dynasty that united China that I was talking about from 221 BC or so. Um, but we don't really know, actually. So the civilizations, uh, we're going to see very ancient ones, like many ancient ones, were built around rivers. So rivers are a good place to have. If you have a choice, and ancient people had more choices than modern people do, uh, they go to very productive areas. So rivers are productive areas, and they make it easy to trade for things that you need. So earliest existing continuous culture. We're going to see stuff uh, that we're going to recognize as Chinese um, from the 3rd century BC, so 2205 BC, and it's going to continue through today. Uh, so it's really impossible to imagine that time span. Um, the only culture that I could say is close to that would be ancient Egypt, which lasted for 3,000 years, uh, but an incredible um, length of time um, when we're talking about Chinese culture. And 
what tends to happen is China, we're going to see, is going to be taken over by foreigners occasionally, uh, some of whom have been since taken over by China. Uh, and what is interesting that happens is that even when foreigners take them over, um, they tend to cynicize the conquerors, uh, meaning they um, kind of make Chinese or um, impose their culture, even though they're the ones that are, that are conquered, on the people who are moving in. Uh, so we see that's part of the similarity with the Roman Empire, uh, where the Latin language and certain types of architecture and building um, became what a lot of people thought of as, as Western. It's the same way with um, this huge area of Asia that we now call China. So sometimes uh, some of these kingdoms will be united, sometimes they'll be split. Uh, the modern borders that you see for China going all the way in red here, uh, it had never been this large um, before the uh, before World War II. Uh, some of these areas were moved in uh, whenever it became the People's Republic of China. Uh, so China is now the largest uh, that it has ever been. And even though it's gone through many governments, including a republic um, and a communist isn't exactly like the best way to describe them, uh, but the modern um, kind of state capitalist uh, state of China, um, it's still an empire. Uh, so even though most of the residents of China, um, east of here or so, <laughs> not west of here, would consider themselves to be Han Chinese, um, that's the ethnicity, uh, it probably wasn't that case in the past. And there is a myriad of cultures and different ways of speaking Chinese within all of these areas. Um, modern day Manchurians, which are up here, do tend to think of themselves as a different ethnicity, but all of these peoples, which have many different cultures and even um, unintelligible languages, uh, consider themselves to be Han, uh, and that kind of shows the, the cynicizing and the persistence of the Chinese empire. So some traditional Chinese beliefs and philosophies uh, we'll talk about Confucius, who's known as Master Kong in China. And we'll talk about some things that he didn't develop himself, uh, but they kind of go through him. Uh, and even less him and more the people that wrote about him that became the Confucian tradition. So ancestors uh, and tradition. And it's important when uh, I talk about Confucius, um, Master Kong, that it would be a good idea to dispel any assumptions that you have because uh, a lot of times from the West, this concentration on tradition uh, will come from Orientalist, uh, meaning um, a kind of white sum supremacist, imperialist type of view uh, about the countries that aren't Western Europe or Northern Europe. Uh, so kind of dispel the simplicity that you might have gotten about what tradition means or ancestors means for China uh, and try to be open-minded and we'll see how that develops over time. Uh, another thing is Taoism, um, and that is the animistic local religion of some areas of China. Uh, and we'll talk about the concept of qi. And then Buddhism, and um, Buddhism isn't native to China, but it did come to China uh, fairly early, and we'll talk about how that affected the art and culture. And then Chan Buddhism, which usually in the United States is known as Zen, and that's the um, Japanese word for it. So we'll talk about the origins of Buddhism uh, towards the end of the class when we get to South Asia. So Confucius, who isn't a historical figure, uh, but as far as what we know about him, um, he, I would say he's a, kind of a legendary figure. Uh, he almost surely existed like Jesus Christ, um, but the stories um, aren't necessarily what you would call history in the modern sense of history, trying to get the most accurate story. Instead of it's a story um, that is useful for people wanting to define what Confucius is. Uh, but he did actually exist, uh, as far as we can tell. And um, he was living in a time of civil unrest. And during this time, um, Chinese people, including scholars like Confucius, looked back to a past, um, and this past is kind of described in a way where there were these uh, 
um, divine emperors that ruled for hundreds of years. Uh, and they had the ancient ways, which, um, which Confucius uh, and mostly his followers wanted to rebuild, uh, were a higher universal order in nature. Uh, so kind of a divine order. Uh, and they saw that as happening in the, in the very far off past, like 5,000 BC. Um, so to get to this uh, higher order, and this applies to everybody, this applies to the leaders uh, all the way down to um, the bottom of society, and this is a very stratified society, self-discipline -dis and proper conduct. Um, and it's important to note that Master Kong uh, didn't usually get into the particulars of these sorts of things, uh, but his followers did, <laughs> down to the point of giving you uh, behaviors that you could use um, in almost any situation you could imagine. Uh, but Master Kong wouldn't necessarily see it that way. He would more think about first principles and less about specific behaviors that come out of that. Uh, so Li are these actions to build an ideal society. And again, that would be more generalistic with Kong. Uh, um, but more specific with some of his followers. And so some of the ways that you could get to that is a person would um, want to cultivate ren, which means human heartedness, a uh, difficult thing to translate, right? Um, the person would want to be educated, broad-minded, loyalty, etiquette, and justice, and other principles would be age, authority, and morality. And this is where it's important to kind of um, try to dispel some of the assumptions that you may have learned about tradition and loyalty and authority, and that these are qualities that must go together. Um, so yes, authority and age, um, but it has to be tempered by justice. Uh, yes, loyalty, uh, but you have to have etiquette. Um, so if a leader, for instance, uh, was ruling in a way uh, where they were exercising their authority, uh, but they weren't moral, uh, they weren't just, um, then there could be procedures to remove this leader. Uh, so it's not a um, authoritarian per se um, type of philosophy. Um, it certainly can be. Uh, and it's more of a idealistic type of philosophy. Uh, and we'll contrast that a little bit later on to the Qin Dynasty, who will be a very authoritarian um, type of philosophy. So some of these Li, these actions to build an ideal society, would be to sacrifice to ancestors and deities. And this all existed before Master Kong. Um, social and political institutions. So this divine order applies to um, these very human in institutions. And then etiquette. And again, some of the later writers will give you just anything, you, every situation you could possibly imagine and exactly what you should do. Uh, but for Master Kong, it's more about um, kind of knowing your relationship to the other person and knowing the rules to follow um, in those particular situations. So ancestors, which again, um, we're going to see evidence of this going back very, very to the earliest Chinese cultures. Um, there's a belief, and it developed over time, we know from writers later, uh, that the deceased continued in spiritual form. And the spiritual form, it can get more complicated, but to simplify, uh, there was a soul and it had two different parts. Um, one part would be the Hun, uh, and that would be, and we'll talk about yin and yang in a moment, uh, that would be the yan aspect of this spiritual form, and it would be located in an ancestral tablet. Uh, and occasionally Chinese families, especially in the diaspora, will keep these sorts of tablets. Uh, and but it's not necessarily something that people would follow everywhere in China today. And then the Po, um, which represents the yin aspect. Again, we'll get into that a little bit later on. And that would be the part of the soul that's in the body. Uh, so the tombs that we're going to see, which are linked to early Chinese life, are going to be to preserve and feed, more or less, the Po. So the descendants were expected to provide this sort of protection um, for the ancestors in death, and that's what the tombs are. So Taoism um, is very interesting. Um, some cultures, all of you that are listening to this have ancestors that once followed an animistic religion. Uh, and animism just means that uh, people look at nature and they see it as being 
imbued with spirituality. Um, so sometimes that can mean that there's nature gods, or even they can see like kind of spirituality in inanimate objects, like um, car, like uh, <laughs> not cars, <laughs> like rocks and the earth and things like that. Um, and you know, like I said, all of your ancestors at one time followed this type of religion. That's a pretty common thing for humans to do, uh, and it was preserved to a certain extent in throughout the period that we're talking about in China, whereas in other places in the world, uh, especially in the Christian and Islamic world, uh, these animistic religions were set aside. Uh, sometimes you see some evidence of them, but generally set aside. So Taoism literally means the way. What that is, <laughs> you can read the Tao Te Ching, uh, and if you read it once, it's fairly simple as far as, as the language. If you understand it, then apparently you read it wrong. Uh, so understanding the way is uh, a very difficult thing to describe, uh, but a lot of people describe it as being flow or um, being in control of yourself, but going with being flexible through time. Uh, and we'll kind of see how that plays out in the art. Uh, and we'll even talk about music and things like that and how that plays out. So it's animistic. It comes from ancient shamanic or divination practice. Uh, so as a result, other than the Tao Te Ching, there's not a whole lot of philosophy necessarily written for it. Um, the philosophy is rather, I guess you could say, um, seems straightforward, but isn't. Uh, so the Tao is thought of as being embedded in nature. Uh, so it fits as a good um, kind of counterpoint to Confucianism, uh, and the two can go together um, rather easily. They kind of complete each other in a way. So how we'll see this play out in the art is we'll see emphasis on harmony and balance uh, and also lots of nature scenes. And then the artists, and this includes like other types of artists, not just visual ones, um, and also just spiritual people in general. Think of the subjugation of the ego. Uh, so in other words, um, downplaying um, that kind of person that's inside of you that sees the world through just that. Um, and how you get to that is through contempl contemplation. And once you've kind of released the ego to a certain extent, um, whether it's through spiritual practice or artistic practice, uh, getting to spontaneity. So the idea that you see in Western art generally um, until the 20th century of a deliberate kind of planning that goes into a work of art, um, we will see some of that, uh, but we'll also see an emphasis on accidental effects and spontaneity. Uh, so from Taoism, and this is pretty much common in every animistic religion, um, there is this... Uh, binary, um, but it's not a dichotomy, uh, meaning um, it is not this or not this. Instead, it's two opposites that um, must go together to create a whole. Um, so like a lot of other cultures, it's thought of as representing feminine and masculine concepts. So the yin would be the feminine concept and the yang would be the male concept. Uh, and I'm sure you've all seen this visualized in this way. And again, it's important to realize that it's much different than um, in a fundamental way um, from Western philosophy. And I can kind of give you an example of how this affects um, people's everyday beliefs. Uh, so generally you see in the West, people have um, that are religious um, will have this belief in heaven and hell. And if you do bad things, um, you'll go to hell. If you do good things, you'll go to heaven. Um, you know, you want to avoid demons or Satan. And you want to go towards God or Jesus. Um, these types of beliefs are actually fairly uncommon in the rest of the world. Instead, people often see um, good and evil as being necessary opposites or even, you know, feminine and masculine. Uh, and other types of opposites is going together. Uh, so if you see a demon in Chinese Buddhist art that we'll see later on, it won't necessarily be a bad thing. Um, this demon could be someone that could challenge you and help you move forward. Uh, so that's kind of a, in a way, a fundamentally different way of looking at things uh, where we're seeing interdependence instead of it is this thing or not this thing. Uh, we're seeing all things um, go together. Holistic is the word that's most often used. 
Uh, and like animism, if you're listening to this, your ancestors probably also had this type of belief and not the kind of Western belief. So Ming is an ultimate inward vision. Uh, it's a way, it seems kind of in contradiction with this, uh, but it's not, we'll, again, think of the, the holistic opposites aren't necessarily contradictory. Uh, and we'll see this play out in the art. So qi is a concept that comes from Taoism, um, but it's, again, it's something that you see in a lot of different animistic religions uh, and other types of religions with um, kind of a, a very visceral type of spiritual practice. Qi means um, sympathetic responsiveness. Um, the idea is that uh, probably the best way to describe it like having a side character or spirit. Um, a best way to describe it, I think, would be a lot of times people in modern parlance, they'll say like they're having like a Zen moment uh, where they're totally in control of what's happening, but everything seems to flow easily. Uh, so if you have this sympathetic responsiveness to Qi, um, to the medium you're using, um, to the techniques that you've learned, to the subject, um, and it just flows out very naturally, um, then you would be said to have this sympathetic responsiveness to qi. And that's probably part of the reason why through much of the hi history um, in the past 2,000 years or so we'll study, that calligraphy is considered to be the highest art um, above painting, um, and poetry is considered to be above painting as well. Because that's one of those ways where you can bring together um, all of this in a unique moment. Uh, so one of the ideas with sympathetic responsiveness to qi is that it can only happen this way in that moment and no other way. Um, so when you're really flowing, uh, you're completely and totally in that moment. So Buddhism um, and specifically Chan Buddhism uh, so Buddhism comes to China in about the first century CE, although the earliest artworks we're going to look at are going to be a little bit later than that. And in the sixth century in China, it develops into Chan Buddhism. And it's basically in some ways a synthesis with Taoist ideas. Uh, so it's got some similarities to Taoism. Um, Chan Buddhists believe in meditation, uh, extensive action, individual enlightenment, harmony with nature, and simplicity. So some of these may seem uh, kind of contra contradictory when people think of meditation, they think of something that's deliberate. Uh, that's not necessarily the way that um, Chan Buddhists would think of it. Uh, and extinctive action as being the opposite. But those two things kind of go together. And the way that they come together uh, in the artwork will often be these very quickly done calligraphic type of pieces. Uh, and something like this might take literally 30 seconds, um, maybe a minute or two. And the artist might do this same subject a thousand times. But this one time, it worked out just right. Um, and that's what they're looking for uh, through this instinctive action. So enlightenment for um, many Chan Buddhists is thought of in a similar way. Uh, you can't really get to enlightenment by um, moving step by step towards a goal. In fact, if you do that, you'll probably get farther away from enlightenment. Instead, uh, you may continue your practice, and one day you may practice it just right and become instantly enlightened, or you could practice it your entire life and never reach enlightenment. Um, so all of this comes together. Simplicity is almost uh, a necessity uh, coming out of these other ideas. So some of the characteristics of Chinese art. So there's Chinese art criticism uh, and analysis going back uh, to very ancient times. So Xie He, um, who is from the fifth century, is writing um, about beliefs that people already had. Uh, so he didn't necessarily develop these ideas. He's just looking at the art world and saying, this is what people believe. Uh, so in his book, uh, The Classification Record of Ancient Painters, uh, which is kind of similar if you ever study Renaissance art, um, Vasari uh, in his writing in the late Renaissance about the artists of the Renaissance and before. It's a similar idea 
talking about the actual artists, but also talking about what they believe and, and what they think makes good art and how they get there. So he talks about sympathetic responsiveness to chi, um, the spirit of the art um, that can only be done by that person in that time in that place. He talks about traditional technique, then innovation. And you see this a lot in um, Chinese education, not necessarily uh, Chinese education in the 21st century, although there definitely is still some of that, um, but Chinese education through the ages, this idea that you learn the old masters, even copy them precisely, which is good for us, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't know what some of the most ancient artists look like. And then once you've mastered some of these, you can move on and create something new. So there's a dynamic we're going to see, and it's going to continue in Japan as well, although not quite as extreme in Japan, this idea of amateurs versus professional painters. Um, the amateurs uh, who make some of the art we're going to look at, they consider themselves to be wenren, uh, which is literati. And that's probably not a word that you use in everyday life, uh, but a literati basically means an educated person um, that does things for... Um, because those are good things to do because they want to, they're curious, they want to move forward in their lives. Um, so they are really interested in Chan Buddhism, especially, you know, when we get to later times and Taoism. Uh, and sometimes they will see in some periods, uh, the professional painters who often work for the courts and for powerful people who probably don't necessarily care what the art means and just want to get something that communicates whatever, you know, their own power or some type of propaganda. Uh, they'll often disparage these professional painters. But we'll see that that's pretty complicated, uh, just like it is the idea of, and I put the quotes up, sellouts in modern society, uh, and that many of the Wen Ren become professional painters later on and well, well respected. So the art that is the most well respected through a lot of the times we're going to look at is calligraphy. Uh, and we'll kind of see how that works as we go along. But it's one of the best mediums for getting to that spontaneity and revelation, these accidental effects. And we'll see the accidental effects even in very deliberate, complex processes like ceramics. Um, they'll basically introduce parts of the technique to encourage these accidental effects. And these accidental effects, if they seem to have this sympathetic responsiveness to chi, this spirit, uh, they would be highly valued. And as we'll see, it's kind of difficult to precisely put a definition of exactly what makes the art great and not so great uh, when it's an accidental. Uh, so we'll talk about that as we go along. So we see a lot of things that are refined simplicity in other words, not simple because you can't do anything complicated, uh, but trying to communicate. It kind of reminds me of the way that um, theoretical physicists talk about elegance, um, trying to take very complex phenomena and bring them down to um, a relatively concise statement uh, that says a lot that you can kind of, it's productive that you can get a lot out of. So the spirit of search, discovery, and refinement would seem to characterize the ideals of Chinese artists throughout the ages. So Riley, who has, writes the textbook, um, has some pretty good statements like this that summarize some ideas um, that are difficult to summarize because we are going to be looking at 4,000 years of history and lots of changes. So this is the way it'll be organized. Um, and with each of these, I'm not going to talk about everything. I'm usually just going to pick a few things that help you to understand what's going on at the time. Um, I'm not doing this as a straight up history class, so I don't feel the need to cover everything. Uh, instead, we're gonna try to understand the best we can um, the world that we're in, and we'll do that through just a few um, works of art or a few artists. So Neolithic period, uh, and if you're not familiar, Neolithic, it literally means new stone age, uh, and it refers to the time when human beings started to farm. Um, so it started earlier in other parts of the world, uh, but we're going for 7,000 BCE in China. Um, Europe did it much later than this, uh, and other parts of the world did it much later as well. Um, in Africa and the Middle East, they did it much earlier. So the Neolithic period is when human beings settled down 
um, and started farming. Before that, uh, everyone on earth was a hunter-gatherer um, and hunter-gatherers made art, um, but usually it was portable art uh, and there wasn't much in the way of architecture. Uh, there are some exceptions, which are kind of interesting. Uh, but the other thing that farming did, which made it um, the largest change in humans uh, in forever uh, until recently, um, is that it farming requires far fewer people um, to be able to produce what humans need materially. Uh, so food and all those, uh, those other things, um, everyone didn't, I don't, amongst hunter-gatherers, usually everyone, unless they're sick or old or very young, uh, is contributing to bring in food um, and other material items. Uh, in the Neolithic period, since you don't need everybody to farm, uh, people did other things, uh, including being artists. Uh, but also, um, many people uh, throughout time um, took this as an excuse to uh, get more centralized power um, so after a few thousand years of this, many societies of farming, many societies started to become stratified. Uh, before farming, there was no hierarchy within human societies. Uh, everybody basically had the same conditions, uh, which were sometimes great, sometimes not so great, depending on what part of the world you were in. Um, and that was the way it was. Uh, and even though societies were kind of aware of the, the dangers of power um, and tried to, to limit that from happening. But with the Neolithic period and farming and people setting down, uh, we see much greater concentrations of power uh, and um, everything that goes along with that. So um, some of the dynasties, the first two at one time were thought uh, to be sometimes in China, uh, but definitely in the West, uh, to be legendary. So the Xia Dynasty and the Shang Dynasty. But we know now that the Shang Dynasty is historical, and I'll show you the historical documents from the time that we have that tell us exactly that. Uh, so now it's believed that the Xia Dynasty, through archaeological digs, there's been lots of stuff that was found, uh, that this is a real thing. That doesn't mean the histories that we'll look at a little bit later on um, represent this time period accurately, but they did represent this period relatively accurately. Um, we're gonna see contemporary documents from this time and then we'll talk about later on um, after the Qin Dynasty about the histories written about this time. And there's a lot of overlap. Um, so maybe some of this stuff was true. Um, before this time, the histories do go back farther than that and they talk about God, humans ruling for 500 years, that's probably a legend, <laughs> definitely a legend. Um, but um, we will kind of see historical evidence from this time. So Zhou Dynasty and the period of warring states, um, I kind of just show a progression through there because it doesn't, doesn't necessarily break up the art so much. Um, but with the Qin Dynasty, we'll, we, we will see a lot of changes that will kind of set up the rest of the class. Um, so we'll spend quite a bit of time on that.